popforconservation.com. Ladies and gentlemen, that's where you want to go to support Congressional Sportsman's Foundation fundraising efforts. Pop for the number four conservation.com is where you can go to be a big winner. 80 winners, over $200,000 in prizes, vehicles, firearms, hunting and fishing packages. Again, 80 winners, over 200 k in prizes. Pop for conservation.com, protecting our pursuits. Pop the number four conservation.com. Go there today to enter. Welcome to the Sportsman's Voice Podcast, your inside connection to the outdoor legislation. From the beltway to policy happening your way, we're covering it all. I'm your host, Fred Bird. Join us as we explore public land access, wildlife and fisheries management, Second Amendment rights, the triumphs that shape our nation, the sports we all love, and the stories that fuel our passion for the great outdoors. This is the Sportsman's Voice Podcast. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, our coverage continues of uh, CSF uh, priority legislation coverage. Uh, we're joined now by Congressman, a uh, Congresswoman, excuse me, Debbie Dingle out of the uh, great state of Michigan. Uh, thank you so much for having us into your office and, and willing to talk about uh, House Resolution 8836 Wildlife Movement through Partnerships Act, or better known as uh, Quarters Act. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. It's great to see you all here. And I love talking about anything related to the Congressional Sports Group. Uh, we're happy for your support and your leadership, and uh, certainly this this uh, opportunity to, to work with everybody uh, across the aisle and the nonpartisan or bipartisan nature of this bill allows uh, for everyone to celebrate a, a win if we can get it done. Uh, working towards uh, habitat improvement, contiguous acres to allow for those migrating species, the, the large undulants that we all enjoy, elk and sheep, uh, mule deer and the like, and then taking that uh, from the west to the east to parts of Michigan as well with migrating species. Uh, give us your thoughts on that and, and, you know, how do you see this all going moving forward? Well, you know, first of all, when we talk about migration, it's fall, and that's the time of the year that we see so many different species migrate. And you were just talking about you know, we see the elk and the and the deer, but I, I think of my late husband, if you want to know the truth, uh-huh. because this is a time that geese and ducks migrate as well. And it's a, it's a, and that, I, it is the Sportsman's Caucus, so I guess I can, you know, that was his favorite season. Well, this is his favorite season, mm. period, was his favorite season of the year for all things. He used to go to Wyoming uh, for the elk and and as somebody who lives in Michigan and lives on the Great Lakes and, and the Detroit Rivers, watching th- th- so many different um, species uh, migrate at this time of the year, it's just something that you know and you watch for every year. So it's a critical part of the North American wild species life cycles. And we know People don't know why it happens, though. And as winter is coming, these species are looking for food. Uh-huh. They're um, looking to breed, and that's part of it. And we need to do things that will aid. We're also beginning to see more and more endangered species. And there are many things that are impeding these migrations or causing problems, and it's causing us to lose species. So we should all be working together to preserve our native species, be it everything from probably the Congressional Sportsman's Caucus doesn't always think about monarch butterflies, but mm-hmm. monarch butterflies are perhaps one of the most endangered species we've seen. They're not on the official endangered species list, but they're challenged for they're sure. They're challenged, and it's a good time in the year to talk about many other species. You talk about waterfowl migrating north to south. I don't think many people consider the monarch butterflies' great flight down to uh, Central America as part of that, that great migration. Uh, of note with this, this legislation is the ability uh, to, to work with private landowners. That's a big part of this. Um, 
migrating species do not recognize political boundaries, and it's imperative that we're able to work with uh, private landowners, uh, large contiguous acre holders to to work with us and remind them that this is a volunteer uh, operation. It's not being mandated. It's not uh, the government's here to help. Uh, and people get nervous. This is a uh, one for all. And I guess, uh, as a colleague said, you know, if you build it, they will they will come and the animals, the species will utilize it, as we've seen with some of the overpass projects and now um, working through this. What people don't realize is that roads, fences, energy, infrastructure, farms, uh, pastures, residential development can block or detour migrating wildlife. So, and the more development we're getting, the more the ha- the fragmentation mm-hmm. of the, the habitats hinders the movement of individual animals um, or the migration of, of populations, um, search for food. And, you know, one of the things people don't realize either is reproduction. A hundred percent. I have wild turkeys. Oh, that... Um, one of those issues is um, the reproduction. So if barriers prevent wildlife from reaching suitable habitats, they're forced to live in unsuitable habitats, and that results in their not breeding and the the populations reducing in size and some becoming extinct. I think, you know, it's it's easy uh, to go to Michigan, uh, go east of the Mississippi, and s- literally see fragmentation on the landscape. You can see it. You can see ag cutting off uh, contiguous acres of old, uh, young growth forest, uh, developments, like you said, um, new energy going in and breaking that up. What, what's not obvious to the eye is when we go out west, you see these vast acres that, that appear to be open, but because of uh, federal land versus private land, that in and of itself, these invisible political boundaries fragment that landscape. And it's so vital um, th- to have and, and nurture these these partnerships and cooperative uh, efforts. We have to do that. And I think something else that people don't see is that when it gets developed, and some of that may have been for farming purposes or cattle breeding or, or, or many different reasons, the monarch butterfly is a good example. They're not able to find the food that they used to. So what we have to do is to, you know, I've talked to gardening clubs, uh, the Garden Club of America, and I've talked in several different states to gardening clubs about just being aware in their private gardens or in public lands along the roadscapes, et cetera, of planting milkweed and other plants that are a source of food for these migrating uh, populations. And that's important, too, is educating everybody. And that's why these grants are important, is making people aware of things. I think the public at large, uh, you know, we always refer to it as the 80 percent when we're talking about the sporting community, which makes up 10 percent or less. um, You know, they just kind of go about their life. They see the migrating birds. They see a, a, a turkey flock in their yard, perhaps. Um, and that's about it. There's, there's no, uh, no other further understanding other than they are there, they exist. And if they disappeared, I don't know if people would notice right away. I don't think people understand how many birds have disappeared, Mm -hmm. uh, in the last couple of decades. Uh, we've talked maybe a little more about the monarch butterfly than we have birds, but the number of birds that are going into extinction and that, uh, we don't see. People take all of this for granted. Or even, you know, it's interesting to have the discussions because I love, I'd never seen a wild turkey until recent years. And mm-hmm. now we are seeing wild turkeys in neighborhoods like mine because they have no place to go. They have no food to eat. And I love them. My neighbors don't. You know, especially when you get a, you, you get a brood of 26 or 30, which uh, we do have. And they don't have any place to go. And I had some mothers that laid eggs that got destroyed. Mm. And we need to worry about all of these things. We talk about deer, and we're seeing many more deer in urban populations now. I was driving from the west side of the state back to my home last Thursday night. A deer ran in front of us, and a truck hit that deer. 
And I know people don't. And if John Deagle were here, he would talk to you about the actual nature of things and how you do. But I, I, I think the cycle is off of what we are watching for our native species of all kinds, from the big animals to the little. And we need to be paying attention to this, paying attention to these corridors, ensuring that we are supporting these populations. And at the same time, that the natural order of things is there as well. You do can think about your generalist species, you know, wild turkey being generalist, coyotes, fox, raccoon, skunk at all. Uh, they can make our living in the suburban environments, largely not be affected until they have human interactions. But when we consider, uh, you know, your your larger undulates, you consider black bear uh, as human populations uh, grow in people. Well, I had a bear in my yard. How about you look at it? We were in the bear's yard, right? So the, the bears have always been there, and we just have this but urban we've sprawl. we've expanded. Yeah. And we've, I mean, look at the great wolf in Michigan, which, you know, we're starting to bring back, but that almost virtually uh, disappeared. And you don't want to lose all of these sure. animals. You want to make sure. I, I'll give you another example. I'm always talking about this in committee because I'm scared to death of them, and I no longer say that I hate them. But bats play a very important Huge. role in preserving our ecosystem. And we are seeing problems because the bats are getting diseased and dying and we're afraid of them. But our ecosystem is paying the price for what is happening. And that's why it's important for us to support these corridors. Yeah, absolutely. As we wrap up here, being cognizant of your schedule, uh, if you would, please, ma'am, uh, speak to the really the bipartisan value. We started talking about this a little bit at the beginning. Uh, I want to wrap it up here. And, you know, it just just really gives power. What you all do here in uh, in these buildings often is very contentious. And then the public at large knows that what, what we are in 2024 leading up to uh, November 5th, it's probably not one of the shinier times in our history. But when it comes to matters of conservation, there's a silver lining there. And, and this this piece is just another example of what we can do together. I, the, supporting these corridors is very important. I'm somebody that believes that working across the aisle, I don't actually think of myself as a Democrat. I don't think of my friends as Republicans. I think of myself as an American. And I really was married to one of the great conservationists uh, Absolutely. in the history of this country. And he never looked at any of this as a partisan issue. He was a hunter and a fisherman. I'm more a fisher person than a but we need to work together because we have a responsibility to protect our great natural resources, to protect our species uh, for the generations to come. And I'm happy when we can all work together on things like that. And by the way, that's what's so important about the Sportsman's Caucus as well. It brings a very diverse group of people together with a common goal. I agree. Everyone loves clean air, water, and, and seeing the... Uh... The critters on the landscape. I don't, I don't think you can find a person that doesn't. Uh, Congresswoman Tingle, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Joined now by uh, Corey Mason, uh, CEO of Wild Sheep Foundation. Uh, can we, we can say this is pretty new. It is pretty fresh. new. How are, how are things going before we kind of get into the nitty gritty? Yeah, thanks for having me, Fred. Things are great. Uh, I'm not quite one month in, yeah. uh, but uh, obviously very familiar with the organization and work alongside Wild Sheep Foundation for many years. And so, yeah, a lot of great conservation initiatives moving forward and uh, excited to be part of it. Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, and then we're here uh, to talk about the corridors bill. We're going to be in a committee later to hear more about that. But, um, you know, certainly we've highlighted that here on the program. It's exciting work. Uh, I have geeked out to the audience about it. I just, I'm just so excited and passionate about the opportunities that lay ahead and continued work. Um, what does that mean for, for you guys at Wild Sheep and, and your membership? And just kind of briefly talk about that. Absolutely. You know, well, to, to, to meet the needs of these large, big game species that are migratory in nature, you know, recognizing they have both summer range needs and they have winter range needs and recognizing as well that some of those needs are met on interior lands and some of those needs are met on forest service lands. And so the ability for this type of bill to continue to move forward from a funding standpoint and collaboration across interior and forest service. Um, so, so from a landscape scale conservation perspective, it, it is the requisite type of background continue to be built on. 
Um, it is needed from, again, to meet the life requisites of these species from elk to deer to sheep and all of these, these large megafauna species. And so uh, it serves the membership well of sheep well, and it serves the conservation of these species extremely well. Sheep specifically, what, is the, what are the populations like? Are, are you guys healthy with that? Now, I, I, true transparency, I've never gotten after sheep. Very interested in doing it, but my knowledge is limited. So for me too, uh, update the audience on you know the species and, and where they're at and, and how this is probably going to help populations. Yeah, so depending on where you are, from of course desert bighorn sheep in the extreme southwest, if you will, all the way of course to to Alaska and and Dahl and Stone in British Columbia, and obviously we're talking a number of different species here, and this most largely impacting bighorn sheep proper, uh, generally speaking. Uh, you know, and recognizing the interactions and some of the issues that have occurred with sheep over the last few decades, um, and those being disease transmission, right. and so ensuring habitat connectivity and habitat health results in ultimately healthier species that have the ability then to uh, sustain themselves through winters and have healthy lambing ranges. And then of course, you know, just meet life requisites. This, this policy that's coming up, this, this piece of legislation, what is, how is this interacting with, with private public land, especially the public land? And how are we able to work with the landowners to see this through? Yeah. So it's a, it's a really neat initiative to have both public private funding and then public private delivery of conservation projects, you know, and to have, particularly in the Western United States, of course, where there's a large majority of public land, to have that interaction and recognizing that patchwork of framework of habitat connectivity that is needed to come together. I mean, it really is the only model that would be successful at scale. And so I uh, really commend Secretary Bernhardt uh, from, you know, 3362 uh, to modern time now to get us to where we are now to continue that initiative forward. And so um, there's a lot of people that brought this, you know, to the table, if you will, but there's equal number of players now that are continuing to move this forward uh, from a supportive standpoint. And so, it, it, again, it's really an absolute requisite to meet the life uh, year-round needs of these species. It's interesting. You know, you, I think about the West and, you know, I go out there and uh, I see these vast open areas. So I just see constant habitat, right? Uh, conversely, and here in the East, uh, boreal and deciduous forests get fragmented up. You can see that on the landscape. But you guys are fragmented up in the West by, by nature of these, these public and private lands and how that's all gridded out. And, you know, in some cases, some guy like me goes out there, if not for something like Onyx or um, one of the other mapping situations, I, I could be in a lot of trouble. But that aside, it's really, it is fragmented from the work you're able to do. So it takes a lot of cooperation between agencies and federal agencies to get some of this done, which is why this is so remarkable and has the support that it does. It does. The model of this particular incentive has been, or initiative, I should say, has really been the model in which things should work forward in the future because it's been a collaboration of multiple federal agencies as well as the private landowner as well. So compliments are due on many fronts. So as we look at the, the public that's involved here and their opinions, has there been pushback? Is there any negative thoughts from, from the general public on this, or is this being celebrated by everybody as, hey, this is a pretty good idea? Yeah, it's been largely supportive, recognizing the species, which really the kind of the poster children, if you will, to move this forward, and then recognizing, again, it's such a scale, it impacts so many other species as well, you know, from small mammals to connectivity of, of many, many landscapes. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a tremendous effort. And when you're, you're able to convey that message, right, to, to that that often lauded 80% in the mill that are either indifferent to what we're trying to do or just happy to see critters on the landscape, that, that non-game species quotient that we're able to tell that part of the story, like, look, we're not just doing this so we can go out there and hunt these species. Like, there is tremendous value all around it, and the work we're doing uh, affects, you know, everything from a, a butterfly to, you know, a warbler you're trying to reintroduce, and this is value for everybody. Moreover, you know, I, I, again, my personal experience going out west to Yellowstone and spending a week and a half out there, that's, that ecotourism and all those dollars and subsequent dollars that come from just wildlife watching, that's a big deal for the economies of those states out there. And this just contributes to that. It's it, exactly right. You know, recognizing that any kind of landscape scale conservation effort impacts maybe not every single species positively, but the majority of the species are certainly impacted when you're trying to conserve landscapes. You know, I sort of make an analogy oftentimes when I was a biologist for state fish and wildlife agencies, oftentimes my phone would ring and someone would invite me out and want to have a management plan written for wild turkey management or waterfowl management or whitetail deer. 
And certainly when I got past that lock gate and we were walking through their property and we were viewing it and we were looking at it, you know, we spent some amount of time on that clearly, but we spent a whole lot more time talking about riparian management. And we spent a lot of time talking about pollinator management and to your point, snag trees for cavity nesters and all different kinds of the whole system approach. And so, so yes, this corridor and this migration initiative has been very successful and hopefully will continue to be very successful for these big game species, again, are really that are kind of the faces behind it, if you will, but it positively impacts virtually every species on the landscape mm -hmm. just by connecting habitats. Do you know it, when, when a new uh, corridor is put in, what is the average time it takes these species to recognize, hey, here's a cool way for me to get across this road or get to something um, and just have it become a natural means of, of traversing the landscape? Yeah, it's almost immediate. Oh, great. Absolutely. Yeah. Within a season, those species adapt to the opportunities for connectivity very quickly. It's interesting. I was, uh, I was with our uh, Rhode Island uh, Legislative Sportsman's Caucus, and one of the issues that came up and one of the members that were there was from the insurance uh, side of the house. And the insurance industry loves this. This is a great idea because it's all cash money net for them, and they're not having to pay out on wildlife vehicle strikes. But, you know, again, there's, there's value there. And, and someone... I don't think uh, most sportsmen would come to think as a beneficiary of something like this is, is that whole side of uh, another industry, and, and they're all for this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there, there's really not a loss to the whole concept. Again, the initiative puts landscapes together in and, and public-private ventures. I mean, it, it's truly a win across the board, and we just cannot give enough compliments to all those that are behind this initiative and all their support to uh, continue to, to keep it moving. Yeah, right, and then in the challenge time, uh, specifically down here and uh, where not a lot of things are getting moved. Um, and then obviously we've got a big election coming up here. It's, it's positive to see uh, at least good discussions and then forward momentum on something like this. Uh, before we wrap up, and I, I'm cognizant of your time and I appreciate it, uh, is there anything you'd like to speak to the CSF audience, the Sports News Voice audience about um, your transition, about wild sheep, or just any other context you want to add to what we're going to hear about today? Yeah, I appreciate that. Well, I would certainly be remiss if I didn't compliment the great work of CSF, the entire team. Uh, Fred, everyone at, at the office, and uh, I mean, just work so collaboratively across the country at the state level, and certainly at the national level here. Uh, the presence in Washington, D.C. is second to none, and many of these issues uh, simply wouldn't happen uh, without CSF, and particularly the bipartisan approach that CSF works is greatly, greatly appreciated uh, across the sportsman's community, so thank you for those efforts. Really appreciate that, and uh, just the privilege of being able to support in a small way. Um, as far as from Wild Sheep Foundation, would love to, you know, engage anyone that has any more questions. Uh, obviously, it's an in, 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 uh, extremely impactful organization, you know, um, with, a, with a focus, of course, on conserving wild sheep and their habitats, uh, with a slogan of putting and keeping sheep on the mountain and really follows that up with the dollars to do that. You know, last year, you look at a, a conservation financial impact of around $11 million by one organization alone, very focused on pressing conservation needs, being habitat, uh, disease interaction, needed research, uh, working extremely collaboratively across the U.S. with state partners, uh, you know, tribes and First Nations, provincial governments, clearly working closely with the Fish and Wildlife Service, and then initiatives in Central Asia as well uh, with some of those species. And so, uh, yeah, it's an impactful organization, but proud to be a partner of CSF. If you would, just because I find it interesting, just can you touch on that, the international side of this and, and the conservation efforts? Is it met the same way? Do they see the value of uh, the North American model and how we do things right and are the envy of the entire planet. Do they, do they see <laughs> that over there? Many of the models uh, outside of the U.S. are a little different. No. Uh, so community-based, for example, in uh, Central Asian countries where it's communities that directly benefit from the management of those species, uh, financially benefit from an employment standpoint, and then, of course, from a financial livelihood standpoint. So, And some of those wildlife species are potentially sort of government-owned, if you will, uh, or community owned. And I kind of say that in air quotes a bit, uh, but nonetheless, it's a very direct on the ground benefit to those local people groups. Uh, and so thus there is a significant buy-in to the conservation of those species and then understanding the significant financial impact of managing those species well, and then having the ability to have some level of sustainable offtake. And so it's a little different model, but it's extremely sustainable and very financially viable model. Um, and then, of course, those arenas then expand out into things like CITES, Convention of Migratory Species, Convention of Biological Diversity, and, of course, Wild Sheep Foundation and others has significant presence in those international theaters as well to make sure that sustainable use 
and scientific-based wildlife management is really the principal and tenant guiding those discussions. Yeah, and I think that's such an important message, uh, not just here, but definitely abroad. And the, the more the more governments are able to see the value in that, uh, it, it makes it hard for some of the anti-crowds to sit there and pick it and be upset about something where not too long ago, a lot of these species are charismatic undulates uh, were almost extirpated and the same thing in Africa, same, you know, there's that value system. And again, if you don't have it, no one really cares about it. That's exactly right. Yep. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Corey Mason, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you being here. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Our coverage of uh, our legislative initiatives down here on the Hill continues uh, where you're joined by Ryan Bronson, the uh, director of legislative affairs for Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. Uh, thanks so much for carving out the time. We're uh, going to wrap up our conversation on corridors um, and wanted to get the perspective uh, from, I guess there's really no one better, right? Uh, right in the thick of things um, from you guys at, at Rocky Mountain Elk. And, you know, uh, we, we've had the overpass projects that, you know, these large undulates have taken to and responded very well to. And now as we look at corridors and working with landowners, private and, and federal and state, it, what a, this is good legislation. This should be a no-brainer. Inevitably, this town finds a way to maybe pick something apart. Uh, this one, not so much, but, you know, talk to us from the, the RMEF point of view why this needs to get done. Well, first of all, this is a bipartisan bill, so we've got friends on both sides of the aisle that are supporting it, so we're, we're very hopeful. But if you look at the work that got started with Secretarial Order 3362 under the Zinke administration when he was Secretary of Interior, mm -hmm. it really set up uh, a system where state wildlife agencies, through by creating migration action plans and then mapping the corridors that are critical to big game, primarily by uh, elk and deer, we've had so many successes, and it's really been a testament to the bipartisan nature of that initiative way back then, that it's continued from administration to administration because secretarial orders we've seen in, in recent years get, the, when a new administration comes in, they kill it. Well, the, the Biden administration has continued that. But for us, we really would like to see it institutionalized long term. And so that was why we wanted to involve Congress to get this into law rather than just through a secretarial order and administrative uh, processes. And there's a lot of support for it and strong bipartisan support leaders from the key committees on both sides of the aisle. We, we really are hopeful that this is going to be able to get done. The resources we all seek to protect, I mean, the habitat as well, because that, that's, a, that's a big part of it. But the motivation here is, you know, the species specific uh, I, um, focus. Once these animals uh, are given an opportunity, they seem to take right to it. So as long as something's getting in their way, nature takes over and they, they do what they do. We keep putting barriers in their way, and we've acknowledged uh, in the coverage so far that, you know, here in the east where we're at right now, you can see fragmented everything. I mean, roads, bridges, railroads, urban sprawl, but out by you guys, it looks like it's all contiguous acres, these vast open lands, but it is not because of these political boundaries that really, you know, set us up for, for tough times. Highways are a barrier. We've seen that. And, th and that's really the interesting thing. When you look at the GPS data, when you put GPS collars on elk and mule deer and you look at how far they move, some of them move hundreds of miles. But a lot of times you'll, you'll look at these patterns on the map and you'll see they'll get to a spot and then they'll stop and they'll congregate. And it's not optimal hab habitat. Why are they doing that? Well, it's because there's a barrier. Oftentimes it's a highway. Getting them across highways to get to the next place it, it's it's a resiliency effort. Elk and deer will, if they can move and find what they need, whether it's winter habitat or summer habitat, they're going to do it. They've been doing it for millennia. Mm -hmm. And so trying to address those barriers has been a key key process. And we've had some success with, with highway crossing funding. But there's a lot more than just those bottlenecks where they have troubles getting across highways or across other barriers. It's the quality habitat, you know, for all of their lifestyle, life stages, whether it's, you know, protecting winter habitat, which in the West is where people like to live, you know, at the bottom of mountains and in valleys. Well, that's critical winter habitat for these animals and in, in winter nutrition and being able to rest. Those are things that we need for our, our herds to be able to 
take care of themselves. And so one of the key focuses for, of this legislation is to create you know, stable funding for states through their action plans to target those areas. We can't protect all the habitat everywhere. So this is the, through this program, we can prioritize the best of the best, and those corridors are really the best of the best. And, and so we know where we can invest our money privately that we raise through the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, and that's millions of dollars. Chapter Banquet's contributing to this. State wildlife agencies, their license fees, they can invest in this. And by leveraging uh, this federal funding, if we can secure it long term, that is going to be passed on to those state agencies to keep keep the work going. And and remember, it's state wildlife agencies that manage these wildlife populations. It's not the federal government's responsibility. It's state wildlife agencies. And that's really what this legislation does is creates financial opportunities for those states to do the work. And rightfully so. I mean, they're the boots on the ground. They're <laughs> literally it's in their backyard. Those are the people we want to engage and make sure the resources are available to them to execute this work. Specifically, as it relates to elk, um, admittedly, I'm an East Coast guy, so I don't get a whole lot of interaction. We're, we're trying to get more elk to the East Coast. Yeah, but... I've, I've heard rumors of that. It'd be interesting to see that happen. The winter ranges versus, uh, I guess, off other seasons, food-dependent snowpack. If you guys aren't getting a lot of inclement weather, will they stay high or do they, will they just by nature and their programming always go to lower elevations? Well, sure. Migrations take energy. And so animals don't tend to expend energy that they don't need to. So if, if it, it, snow often is what drives animals off the top of the mountain, out of the national forest, down to the bases of the mountains. Um, so, yeah, that, that, that's part of it. But given the elevation, usually elevation means winter weather. And so the, having those migrations are important. And, and when you look at places like Wyoming and the Red Desert, um, you know, it's called the Red Desert for a reason. And so you, they need to move from place to place to find the resources. And sometimes that's water resources that are seasonally available. Those are all factors in the overall biological integrity of the species. So, um, but yeah, as any good elk hunter knows, you know, if you don't get weather pushing the elk from elevation, sometimes they're hard to get to when they're up on top of the mountain. And in the winters, that's when they tend to come down and avoid the deep snow so that they don't have to expend so much energy to be able to move around and also have access to forage so that they can uh, survive the winter. I got to imagine that's probably an outlier and doesn't happen too often. I'm just always just merely curious about how they, their movements and then, you know, to your point, they're, they're need driven, but don't want to expend all that energy. And that's why protecting the whole corridor is important mm -hmm. because the elk and the deer will move to where they need to be to get, find what they need. And it's weather dependent. And if, if winters are getting milder, they might not need to move as much, but in bad winters, they certainly will continue to need those resources. The ability to have corridors in place and, and what you're looking to see and then the, the goal of this to have it in perpetuity solves for those what ifs and not, not really relying on those outliers or potential weather pattern changes. This has to be there for just, just to solve for everything. And it's, I think it's just good policy. And it sounds like um, most agree on this and it should be a low piece of hanging fruit that everyone on either side can celebrate. We hope so. And, you know, at the Elk Foundation, we really pride ourselves on being a bipartisan organization. And some of the partners that are in our coalition working on this consider themselves left of center. Some of the people in the coalition consider themselves right of center. But we've got this broad array of organizations working together. And obviously, the Congressional Sportsman's Foundation being the largest bipartisan caucus playing a critical role, bringing those two sides together. Uh, we've got chairmen on board. We've got ranking members on board. Early indications are that we hopefully will be able to get this to pass. Uh, you know, we, we, we do need to find the money for it. So those are all, those are all issues, but uh, we think we can work through. Oh, so worthy investment. And uh, yeah, to your point, this is, um, this is something everyone can get behind and, um, this, this work is nonpartisan, and that's you know, obviously with our organization working with you guys in partnership, it just, it just makes sense to put any sort of labels on it. It's, 
it's quite confusing, honestly. I don't know how this one could be one way or the other. This is good for everybody. Um, and users are not. You know, this this is good good work for anyone that doesn't get a hunting license or any of it. They just like to see the elk in their backyard or, you know, the other critters. So, well, we obviously look forward to a positive outcome on this and, and to celebrate with our partners to include you guys at Rocky Mountain Elk. And yeah, I, I think that I'll leave you with the parting words there. We've covered this pretty well and lack of controversy sometimes leaves lack of words. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, we it, it's it's all good here and I uh, just want to see it kicking on. Well, thanks. Thank you very much. You know, the Elk Foundation mission is to ensure the future of elk, other wildlife, and our hunting habitat uh, and our hunting heritage. Those are all important parts of our mission that we partner with the Congressional Sportsman's Foundation all the time on, and, and we really appreciate that partnership. And uh, uh, honestly, your Taylor from CSF did a great job testifying on this bill. He did. Uh, he represented our community well um, and, and know that you know, he was speaking, we were speaking with one voice on that That's issue, exactly and we right. look forward to it. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your time. Thank you so much to our guests for this special part two on uh, wildlife corridors legislation. Corey Mason, Congressman Dingle, and Mr. Bronson uh, for their thoughts. Again, another, another piece of uh, positive legislation here that's got a ton of upside. Uh, makes a whole lot of sense. Uh, you think you get the enthusiasm from me as we've covered this multiple times. It's a pretty exciting uh, opportunity for 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 everyone, for the critters, um, for people that live in these places, uh, ecotourism, all of it. It's just there's just so much upside here and um, a good solve for some problems. An increasing landscape that is fragmented. Um, yeah, good, good problem-solving ability here. So uh, let's get this one over the finish line for sure. Folks, that's it. Thanks so much for tuning in uh, for this special part one, part two of the program. Next week, our roundup, as always. And during the off week, I invite you to go back. We have a great library now built up of some excellent uh, storytelling episodes, policy coverage, uh, especially here in the last month and a half. So uh, do go back, check out that that library of, of shows and a lot of great stuff there and uh, you'll be entertained and you got some time to listen to it on our next feature episode catch up with a uh, longtime friend greg ritz we're talking about the resurrection of thompson center arms uh really specifically getting into muzzle loading a great great company that uh that went away and now back in the very capable hands of uh of greg who once had it and uh the brand muzzle loading all that being covered, and then also fire stick technology, uh, getting into what that looks like, where you can use the fire stick, where it's under review, where it's illegal, and the opportunity it presents uh, for us uh, to work within our state legislative sportsman's caucuses uh, through the NAS network, connecting the dots between states that, that allow for it and working with legislators uh, in states where it doesn't allow and, and, and making that opportunity available, hopefully. So, uh, all that and more in a couple of weeks. Like I said, we'll catch up with Greg Ritz. And um, until then, uh, our, our thoughts, our hearts are certainly with uh, our friends, our family members, our partners uh, throughout Appalachia. Um, as I'm recording this, uh, and a couple of days in advance of this drop, um, Milton, Category 5 hurricane bearing down on the west coast of Florida. So, um, We'll see you guys on the other side. Stay safe. Hunker down. Hopefully you got out. And uh, just just be safe, guys. Golly days. Um, it's, been a, it's been a rough go for a lot of you. For those of you that are uh, still hitting the fields or in the field, uh, be safe. Get home to your families. And uh, hope you're having uh, lots of good, positive experiences out there in the wilds of this great country. All right, guys. We'll see you next week. Thanks so much for tuning in. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us on this edition of the Sportsman's Voice podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, your support is crucial, and you can help us out right now by leaving a review, filling in those five stars where available, sharing this episode with friends and family, and engaging with us socially. CSF can be found on Facebook, Instagram, and X, formerly known as Twitter. Together, we can protect the outdoor sports we love and continue to keep you informed wherever you are. That's it for this week. Until next time, see you later.